Hi, my name is Drew. I'm going to be walking you through the A-Liner Ranger 12 today. Uh, we're going to start right up front here with the coupling and uncoupling procedure. Uh, what we have right here is going to be at the front of your tongue going to be your coupler. As it sits here, this is going to be in the unlocked position. That locked position is going to look something like that. Uh, we are paying special attention that we do have this secondary latch engaged. Uh, of course, anytime you are securing this down, go ahead and give it a, a upward pull to make sure you are in fact locked in there. Uh, you also can use a secondary pin here. That's going to, that's going to give you further protection again from uh, this potentially uh, rattling loose and opening up inadvertently. Uh, so this is the unlocked position again. That's going to be the starting position when we do uh, go to load this. So from there, we're gonna go ahead and crank this jack up. Uh, generally, it's going to sit three inches above your ball. We would then go ahead and back our, back our receiver and our ball underneath the coupler here, lower it back down on top of that ball. Uh, again, once we are fully seated, we're gonna go ahead and lock this back, give that that secondary check. Then we can go ahead and run this jack all the way up. From there, we're gonna go ahead and remove this wheel because that wheel is only designed to be in place when the unit is stationary. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and store that in a storage compartment or, or wherever we choose to do so. And then we're gonna finish hooking the unit up. Uh, what that is going to look like from there is we're gonna take our tow chain hooks. We are going to cross those underneath the coupler. It is very important that we uh, not only cross them under the coupler, but we allow enough room for us to make our, our left hand and right hand turns, but also not too much room because it is state law in Texas that these tow chains cannot make contact with the pavement at any time. Uh, also state law in Texas is that they do need to be crossed, so we do want to remember those two points. Uh, so with those connected to your receiver, riding right beside them, you're going to have your emergency breakaway cable. And now this has a twist tie on it right now. I'm going to go ahead and undo that and let you see what that looks like. So this is your emergency breakaway cable. This is essentially your last line of defense. If this coupler were to fail and these tow chains uh, were to fail here, it's going to go ahead and uh, pull this out like a ripcord, effectively locking up your electric brakes. Uh, so it is important that we have a third connection point on the receiver, whether that be a quick link, carabiner, whatever you choose, that's going to ride directly beside these tow chains. Uh, of course, again, same rule of thumb, excuse me, enough slack to turn left or right, but not so much slack that it uh, makes contact with the pavement. Uh, we also have your seven-way plug here. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on your bumper. This is going to give you full function to your vehicle, your towing vehicle's charging system, braking system, and marker lights, tail lights, things like that. Whenever this is plugged into your bumper receptacle, think of it at that point as one large vehicle. Uh, again, they're going to be linked up uh, for all intents and purposes, like one large vehicle. Hopping up here to your battery. Uh, this is a deep cycle interstate battery. Uh, this does carry some maintenance with it. What that's going to entail is two or three times a year, we're gonna pull these vent panels up. We're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So there's a clear marked water level inside, and we do just wanna maintain that water level with distilled water. Uh, other than that, it's not a bad idea since this unit is not uh, factory equipped with a uh, battery disconnect switch that you physically disconnect these terminals again for periods of long-term storage. What that's going to do is keep any nominal or phantom draws off of the system, allow this battery to, to keep uh, in, in tip-top shape. Uh, all we're contending with at that point is just changes uh, in the environment or environmental drain. Uh, also one thing you're going to want to pay attention to is you do have a 25 amp fuse uh, there in that inline fuse holder. Uh, you'll notice that if that fuse gets blown, you're going to have reliability issues with like your lights, uh, marker lights, things like that, uh, turn signals, uh, also a lot of you know, functionality issues there on your 12 volt appliances as well, so keep that in mind. Uh, we do have a 20 pound propane tank directly behind that, uh, same variant you're going to find on any gas grill, open and close valve on the top, I find most people are somewhat familiar with these tanks. Uh, it's up to you if we, whether you keep this tank with the unit or once it rain, uh, runs out, you go ahead and exchange it uh, at a gas station. Uh, to go ahead and remove it from the unit, we have two J hooks that are transitioning through the frame there. Uh, on the underside of each one, there's going to be a wing nut. We just go ahead and remove that wing nut and then go ahead and uh, pull this out. Uh, we would do the same for this one. 
from there we would just disconnect the pigtail here and go ahead and get that tank filled or exchanged. Uh, moving around here to the side of the unit, we have a ZAMP style solar plug here. Uh, what that does is it's just a direct connection to the battery. Uh, what this is designed for is those portable solar panels, uh, briefcase style folding panels. Uh, either way, this is essentially just a plug and play connection to the battery. So what that means for you is if you are utilizing uh, any of those portable panels, uh, you don't physically have to park your camper in the sun to take advantage of solar. You can plug in here, draw your panel out into the sun, and then of course it's going to take in energy as necessary. Once the battery is topped off, it's going to stop taking in energy. Uh, we have your outside shower here, nothing too crazy with this. You do have access to hot and cold water, a nice little hanger there uh, for the head. Uh, works really well. Uh, everything does kind of uh, roll up and store in that compartment as well uh, when going down the road. Uh, we have your fridge panel here. Now this is a three-way refrigerator. Uh, runs on 110 volt electricity as well as 12 volt DC electricity uh, as well as propane gas. Uh, when we are looking here down at the display, uh, all, of our, uh, all of our functions are going to be utilized from this compartment here. Uh, so what that means is if we go ahead here right off the bat and we make a line down the center, everything here on the right side is going to be utilized for electricity, whether that's 110 volt electricity uh, or 12 volt. We would turn the switch on here and then go ahead and, and choose our temperature here. Uh, if we're running it on propane, we're going to uh, light it and control the temperature with this knob here. So everything here on this side. Uh, it is running right now on propane. Uh, we can confirm that if we go ahead and slide this back. Uh, you may be able to see a little flame in there, but generally it's kind of hard to see. Probably not going to, uh, you know, translate well on camera, but it is there. Uh, so in one thing we do want to be sure is that we only run one source at a time. So now that I'm going to go ahead and show you how to run this on electricity, I want to go ahead and turn this off. Uh, so here on this side of things, if we're running on 12 volt, we'd go ahead and turn that red switch on. Then we would go ahead and, and, and uh, you know, choose this to our temperature, which is going to be one through seven. Uh, same on electricity, 110 volt electricity. So I turn it on here, one through seven, choose my temperature. If I want to turn it off, I take it all the way to zero. Uh, when we're lighting it on propane, uh, this can be problematic because these, these appliances, they run very efficient on propane. Uh, what that means is as it sits those lines clear of propane, and since it runs so efficiently on propane, it can take a long time or longer than you would expect for uh, it to express that air from the line and give you a fresh pull of propane. So generally what I recommend my customers to do is go ahead and turn this to high and go ahead and push this in for about 30 seconds before I even start uh, activating the igniter here. Uh, now I just had it lit on propane so it's not going to give me any trouble so in, in just pretend that I've had this lit uh, or had this held down for 30 seconds and from there I'm going to uh, actuate this piezo igniter as quickly as I can uh, every so often making looking in this window making sure I have lit it on propane. Once I do see a flame in that sight window I'm going to hold my finger there on that button for another few seconds allow that thermal coupler enough time to heat up from there, it's going to stay on on its own accord. And then again, I can choose my temperature low, medium, and high. So very easy to use. Again, all your controls are going to be here. Uh, go ahead and give it a visual inspection from this area. Uh, again, you know, a few times a year or anytime you're, you're in this compartment, uh, lighting and you're choosing your source, go ahead and look around. Make sure you don't see any frayed wires. Make sure nothing's nesting in here. Uh, also very important to keep anything from nesting in there. Uh, we do want to go ahead and screen off these vents further. So you have openings here on each vent. Uh, they do make specifically cut bug screens for each one of these vents. Uh, and that's what we're aiming to do is keep those mud daubers and flying insects from, from nesting in the compartment. Now these vents, they go on uh, top first. We're going to line up the tabs there. Uh, once we do so, these bottom pieces should go in relatively easy. They can give you some trouble sometimes. Uh, once everything is nice and flush, we go ahead and give those a slight turn. That's going to go ahead and lock it on. I always go back, give it a secondary pull here to make sure it is in fact locked on. We have your furnace here. Uh, again, very much like the uh, refrigerator vents, this is an intrusion point for mud daubers and flying insects, so we do want to go ahead and screen that off. Uh, other than that, it is very important that we do not restrict the flow. 
Uh, we want to keep it breathing properly. We don't want to put like a lawn chair or anything up in front of it. It does blow very hot air when it is on, so keep that in mind. Uh, down low, again, we have your drain outlet. So there is no holding tank in these units uh, for the gray water. Uh, what that means for you is you need to either have a bucket or a receptacle here to catch your wastewater. Uh, you can also reduce this down to a garden hose size fitting. That would allow you to, at the very least, route your wastewater away from your campsite. Uh, when going down the road, make sure this caps is, cap is in place and you'll be good to go. Uh, tire pressure and lug nuts. It's very important that we do talk about those. Uh, lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Uh, manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. Uh, that retorque procedure is the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. It is very important that we do go ahead and retorque those down to 100 foot-pounds. Manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after that we do go ahead and check and make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot-pounds of torque. So it is very important. Uh, you driving this unit home is going to be essentially the first time these tires have ever met the road. And it is, again, very important that we follow that torque procedure. Tire pressure, uh, you're going to run any trailer tire at the max tire pressure rating. You can find that stamped onto the sidewall of the tire, uh, as well as on this data tag here. And it looks like it's going to be 60 PSI. So 60 PSI is, again, the max tire pressure rating. It's exactly where you want to run it, whether you have a completely full load or a completely empty load, that 60 PSI is going to be the ideal number. We have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Uh, now this only plugs into the unit one way. If we go ahead and look here at the prongs, uh, one is L-shaped. As long as we match up the L-shaped prongs, this is going to feed right in. We're going to give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down, lock it in further. Uh, now for every unit that I deliver, I make the same recommendation. That's going to be a 30 amp, 110 volt surge protector. It is very important to protect the delicate electronics that you do have on the inside. Uh, RV parks, campgrounds are kind of famous for having uh, substandard kind of dirty power, as one would say. And it really is truly the only thing you can do to protect your investment. So it is something to remember there. Uh, also, we do include a 30 to 15 amp reducer with the unit. Uh, this is helpful if you want to go ahead and run some low draw appliances, uh, things like that, pre-cool your refrigerator, you can absolutely do that with this uh, reducer. Now if you want to do some long-term camping or run the air conditioner uh, on 15 amp service, I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and upgrade from a uh, standard puck style reducer like this to a dog bone style reducer which is just separated by about 12 inches worth of cord and dissipates a heat a whole lot better. So generally, if you use this for hydraulic appliance, it's going to get very hot. I have actually seen where these can melt themselves onto the end of your cord. So something to be aware of there. Six gallon capacity water heater here. Uh, now this is a propane water heater with 12 volt ignition. Uh, first off, from a maintenance standpoint, it is very important that we do keep these screened off again from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, other than that, manufacturer recommends that you, uh, specifically recommends that you do uh, drain it anytime it is going to be in storage for more than seven days and of course feed six gallons of water into the unit separately uh, before using. So to depressurize it uh, for draining, of course, give it ample time to cool down. Uh, once you're certain that it is cooled down, uh, you turn the hot side of any spigot on. Let that excess pressure bleed off through the hot side uh, of the spigot. Uh, once you're uh, certain that the pressure has bled off, you're going to come here with an inch and, inch and a sixteenth uh, ratchet and extension, back that drain plug and anode rod out. Now that anode rod is a replaceable part. Expect to get a year or two in between anode rod changes. Um, other than that, again, the flip side of that conversation, manufacturer wants you to push six gallons of water into the unit before lighting it. Uh, again, you're going to use the hot side of any spigot to do so. So that flow is going to initially be very interrupted, very flowy. Uh, once that flow normalizes, uh, that is your indicator that you can go ahead and light this off. We have your potable water fill here on the left. Uh, you'll stick a garden hose directly in there, fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once you're full, cap it off, use the onboard water pump there on the inside to pressurize that system, draw that up to the fixtures. Uh, your city water connection here, uh, very important that we do use a water pressure regulator for that. 
One is included for uh, with your purchase. That water pressure regulator is going to hook directly to the spigot and then the spigot side of your hose to that. And then of course you'll connect it here to the camper rotating this trailer brown connection here. Uh, very important that we do reduce that water pressure. Uh, that tank that we filled uh, via your potable water fill here is drained via this water line here. It does just have a cap on it. Uh, on the back side here, nothing too crazy, full size spare. Uh, stabilizer jacks there on the rears, license plate bracket, uh, tail lights, things like that. So here on the inside, uh, right here when you come into the entry door, we first up have your fire extinguisher. Uh, something we want to check every time before we take the unit out, uh, there is a pressure gauge on there. Make sure that we are maintaining that pressure. Uh, in the event that we do need to use this, it is going to be ready to use. Uh, we also have a, a little light there that's to light your way coming into the unit at dark. Uh, very helpful feature there. Uh, also, you have access to the uh, the storage compartment here, which is again accessible from uh, the outside as well as as well as from the top. So, if you have some large gear in there, you need to to go ahead and lift out. You can do so. Uh, also, have many ways to access that. So, we're going to start here with uh, making the uh, pedestal table, taking that apart, and making this into the secondary sleeping area. With any pedestal table, you're going to separate the tabletop from the flange and the base. So with those separated, we can go ahead and set this off to the side for now. And again, we're going to do the same thing with that. We're going to wiggle that out from the flange. Uh, and then we're going to take these four pieces of slat here, and we're going to lay those out evenly. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but we're going to space those out as best we can. Something like this, and of course we have four of them, so. So something similar to this. And then we take these two back cushions, lay those out there, and that would be that secondary sleeping area. Now we're gonna go ahead and put it all back together. So we would take these back cushions, we're gonna put those back uh, where they go. And then I'm going to feed these back there into the little keeper there. It is convenient having that space to hold these. It is a pretty tight fit, so you do need to go relatively even in there. something like that and then we're going to go ahead and take your pedestal and we're going to put that into the flange on the floor and then your tabletop on top of that and it'll be a little uh, loose at first but you just kind of work it in uh, allow it to tighten up and it is very usable from that point on uh, we also have your privacy shade here uh, we have one of these at the front and the rear. Uh, it is just a friction, uh, so it is just held up by friction and it is just going to be a pull upwards. Uh, each light fixture, again, we have one of those front and back. Uh, those switch is going to be right there on the actual fixture. So easy on off operation there. Uh, we also do have storage on the underside of this dinette cushion as well. Uh, from here, uh, we have your main switch cluster. Uh, this is going to control your water pump. That's going to uh, pressurize that potable water system and allow that water to be drawn up from the tank to the fixture. And then we have your water heater switch. So with both of these switches, uh, down is going to be off, up is going to be on. When we initially turn this water heater switch on, this red light is going to generally come on with it. That is really our indicator as if the, to, to as if the water heater has lit. Um, generally it'll cycle three times. If it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it's going to allow that light to stay on permanently. Uh, so what you're going to do is that in the event that that happens, generally that will only happen if you are uh, either out of propane gas completely, you do not have the valve up front on. Uh, also, unlikely in a camper of this size, it can just take a little extra time for the propane to make its way through the line to the actual appliance. 
Either way, in the event that that happens, of course, check, make sure you have propane, make sure the valve's on. And then from there, we're just gonna turn the switch off, turn it back on. It's gonna go ahead and recycle another three times. Um, and generally, as long as you've corrected the issue, of course, it's going to light uh, on the first try of the second cycle. Uh, now we went ahead and, and t talked about the operation of the refrigerator there on the outside of the camper. Uh, not generally much you're going to be doing from the inside of here. It should look very typical of what you're going to find in like a dorm style refrigerator. Uh, but I did just want to open the door so you could get a, an eye on that. So we have your cooktop here. Uh, this is your standard kind of basic uh, camping stove cooktop. There's no sparker, there's no igniter. Um, what we would do trying to light this is we're going to go ahead and turn this to light. Uh, we're going to stick our long stem barbecue lighter flame directly onto the burner there. Uh, and once that lights, we're then going to be able to choose, uh, you know, a low flame or a high flame here on the spectrum. Uh, it goes without saying that before closing the, the roof panels down, this does need to be closed up. So you're going to fold in this windshield here and make sure that is closed. Of course, very good time to bring up that when you are, again, closing the wall panels, Everything does need to be below this hinge that does include any cushions within the unit. Uh, hopping over here, we have your uh, 5000 BTU window air conditioner. Uh, this also has a remote with it, so you can operate it with that. Uh, it does have a power switch there. Uh, mode button here, you have a multitude of different modes, whether that's a dehumidifier, fan, uh, or air conditioner. Uh, thermostat here, so it'll kick on and off to maintain that temperature. We can set a timer as well uh, if we if need be. I uh, find most people are generally familiar with uh, the setup of these. Uh, they are very standard as to what you are going to see with any window AC. Uh, moving over here back to the kitchen area. Uh, of course, we have your sink here. Now it's going to be, uh, this is of course your nozzle. Again, we'll need to fold that down, uh, your fixture down when uh, closing the roof panels. But uh, this is your on off switch here. If we go straight out from that down position, that's going to be cold water. If we were to go up and out, that's going to be hot water. Blower motor here for the furnace. Uh, that is a 12 volt blower motor. All your heat is going to come from this space here. We have your thermostat for that furnace uh, right here on this wall. Uh, now this is just a slider. Um, so you're going to guesstimate your comfort level, uh, slide this along that axis there. That's going to tell that blower motor to kick on. Blower motor comes on uh, immediately. About 16 seconds after that, it ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Um, generally in a unit of this size, it's, it's not uncommon for it to set off the smoke alarm. Uh, if I were you, I'd be prepared for that. It's just it, within that first 15 minutes of operation, it does not run as efficiently as it will uh, after that. Uh, and again, so it, it's, it's very hard uh, for it not to set off the smoke alarm. So, so be prepared for that. Uh, above my head here, we have your fantastic fan. Um, you would crank that up, which I've already done. You'd unlock it, crank it up. Uh, of course, you have to choose a direction and a speed. So this is a three-way switch. Middle's going to be off. Uh, down's going to bring air in from the outside. Up's going to go ahead and exhaust it. And then we choose the speed. It gets up and moves there. You have a, a bus-style fuse holder here. Most importantly, when we're done using the fan, it is very important that we do go ahead and close it. as well as lock it. So you do want to make sure you're locking it. That's going to keep that from rattling loose as you're going down the road there. Uh, here in the bed area, um, down low, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Uh, everything we see there on the left side is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. Or excuse me, everything there on the left side is going to be your 110 volt light switch style breakers. Um, same variant you're going to find in your fuse panel box at home. Everything there on the right side is going to be uh, your automotive blade style fuses here. So those are replaceable. It's not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses. Uh, keep them with the unit. Then we have your uh, carbon, your carbon monoxide LP leak detector here. Uh, that is an important piece of safety equipment. Uh, we do want to go ahead and test that every time before we take the unit out. Uh, it does have a test button. Functions very much like a smoke alarm. Uh, it'll let you know which one of those gases it is sensing in, in case of an emergency. Uh, and there is no batteries to change. It is, again, wired into the 12-volt section of the camper. Uh, a lot of this stuff we've already seen with the pull-up shade, the lights here. Uh, that's all pretty standard stuff. Uh, last but not least, we're going to go ahead and go over the process to make this 
uh, into a bed. It could not be simpler. Uh, if you have a uh, this secured here, there's a little keeper, you would undo that. Then you're gonna slide this uh, baseboard uh, out. We're then going to lay out the cushions and fill, up, fill in any gaps. And look something like that. Uh, so that's gonna be the bed area here. Alrighty, so we're gonna go ahead and put everything down. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Uh, of course, as I mentioned earlier, we do need to make sure everything is below that hinge line. That is the most important thing. Uh, that does include cushions. Uh, also, we need to go ahead and turn these lights off. Now, if these lights have been on for an extended period of time, it is also a very good idea to go ahead and let them cool. Um, so with that in mind, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do these rear wall panels first. Uh, the reason why we're doing both, both latches is because once I, this wall panel always comes down first, once I go ahead and put that wall panel down, I'm not going to have uh, enough room to reach that. So I go ahead and do the back ones. Then I come up here uh, to the front one. I go ahead and, and do, undo that. Uh, allow this wall panel to come down. Of course, there is nothing keeping this wall panel is free floating. There's nothing keeping it uh, in place. So if I go ahead and remove my hands from it, it is going to fall down. So keep that in mind. A lot of people do neglect that as well. And then again, I've already done that rear hinge there, so I can go ahead and do this one. Uh, but before I go ahead and put it down, this is very important, I need to go ahead and separate the door panels here. So once I have separated those panels, I need to go ahead and, and hold this into this halfway position. As you can see, this top of this door uh, will come in contact with that uh, aluminum sidewall if not. So as I help it down, I can go ahead and lay this here. Uh, now couple scenarios here. Now if it's just me doing this like I am now, uh, I can go ahead and pop it loose from the inside. Now if I'm utilizing the high wind kit, which we're going to go ahead and take a look and see what that would look like from the, um, you know, for the rest of the, the presentation or when we put it up, we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, but let you see how to do it if it were just you. You would then disengage that high wind kit. If it were, again, you were by yourself, you would disengage it so it looks like it is now. Then you'd hop in the doorway like I am now, and you're going to put your hands as close to center of you can, as you can of the wall panel. You're going to go ahead and you're going to lift up. Uh, what we're doing is we are just popping that wall panel out from that track up front. And once we've done that, uh, we are pretty much through there on the inside. We do need to make sure that both these doors are closed, and we do make, need to make sure that if we have this rolled up, that it's not going to restrict that door from closing fully. And it does look like it is getting in the way there. Uh, so just to be sure, I'm going to go ahead and um, lay it flat. Keep that from bunching up uh, for us. Something like that. It is important that both these doors do need to be closed uh, because this all kind of nests over top of it. And then again, uh, in the event that you were using the high wind kit, uh, you would, of course, take this arm here. Uh, you would ultimately be unlocking it from this position. What this high wind kit allows you to do is really get a handle on that roof panel there uh, because if you have a strong back wind, what that's going to do is travel up this uh, rear wall panel and as you're, you know, the more you, further into this position you get, it's going to come up this back wall, hit that front panel uh, and going to be fighting you the whole time. Believe it or not, if you, it can do serious damage to the camper as well. So with, you know, as best you can, keep a hand on with this and go ahead and, and feed this down. Uh, once we do so, we're going to get to a certain amount of a certain position where we do need to uh, fold this towards the front. We'll come back and lock that down. But our latch here is going to be at its highest point with uh, its highest point when it is flat. Uh, once we are, go ahead and latch. And sometimes you might have to help that compress those seals. And also sometimes you may need to, um, you know, kind of move this around to go ahead and get it to actually latch in the correct position uh, because of course the, the tolerances aren't uh, exceptionally tight and something like this. So let me go ahead and latch this down so I'm not fighting with it. And then we'll come over here to the other side and we'll take a look at that latch. 
And again, we have a bar here. Uh, we would have went ahead and uh, buckled that down as well. And then again, something like that. So that is fully closed. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do the exact opposite and, and erect it. Uh, and when I'm doing so, I'm going to use the high wind kit. Of course, the high wind kit is best suited when you have another person there to help you. But you can go ahead and do it by yourself like I am here. So I'm going to, of course, start with this latch. I'm going to come around here to this side. I'm going to unlatch it here. And I'm going to still keep everything closed. Well, I go ahead and undo this latch here. And again, this is going to give me a handle to keep this from going, getting taken away from me. And I can also use it to lift. Now, I do reach a point when, when lifting it up where pushing up does, not, does no longer does me any favors. From there, I need to use this hand to help. And once I'm in there, I'm looking to lock that in. And again, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to lock, make sure this panel is. You can see I have that side pretty much locked in, but this side is not. So I need to help it. You're, listening to, you're looking, for that, uh, looking for that firm click into position. I'm going to go ahead and engage this part of the wing kit. This is locking those two roof panels together. Uh, again, not only gives you an assist handle when you're erecting it, but also it's going to make everything more secure uh, when using it to have those roof panels locked together. So from there, I'm going to finish up. I never did lock this panel in, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to put up the sidewalls. So from here, I'm going to start with this wall because we ended with this wall. So this one goes up first. And then when I'm putting these uh, latches in here on the inside, I like to use the palm of my hand uh, kind of as close onto the latch as I can again because we're compressing seals. So I got to kind of uh, go in both directions, something like that. From there, I can go ahead and lock this in like so. And then I'm going to go ahead and put this wall up. Again, using the palm of my hand to help that latch in there firmly. And then I finish up with the two rear latches. I didn't get this one in all the way. Here you go. And that's how you put this, uh, the, the A-Liner Ranger 12 up or down. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this walkthrough. Uh, thank you.